llama no se apagará es un río que no se detiene el arca por fin está en casa el rey ha venido a morar oh, el avivamiento en casa de Broadway River Church es un río que no se detendrá jamás oh, oh, oh. River Church es un I Here's caught this sermon proposes that literally the scientific term or technological term it's given to that which elevates a spaceship. The proposers that once that rocket leaves the atmosphere, they fall, they are ejected by the astronauts, by the pilots that are inside, they eject these proposers because it's an unnecessary weight. But if these proposers, this ship, could never get to where it has to. The proposal is just something that helps that spaceship to get to its destination, then it's ejected. Question. The rocket ship. Could it leave and get out of our atmosphere, our earthly atmosphere, without the proposers? No. Can these proposers go up with a spaceship? No, because it's unnecessary weight. They have to be ejected so that the spaceship can fly lightly. Now, when you think about death, when you think that you're going to die, and that eventually we're all going to have to leave, you have to know it's not the end of the story. Because one day our lives will get to its end, but the kingdom of God still advances towards victory. And if you think that you wasted your life, that you didn't let the kingdom be extended through you, I suppose that those who know God, we get frustrated too much when we think that the kingdom could be extended through us, but don't do anything because our mortal hands can help to edify God's kingdom. How many believe it, right? Our mortal hands can be useful. It's a privilege that very few human beings have. Our mortal hands can be used like these proposers that elevate the spaceship. What's the spaceship? The preaching of the gospel. The extension of the kingdom of God. And we're just proposers that once we have our determined age, someone in heaven says, ejecting. And we'll go, our mortal bodies will go to the grave, but our spirit will go with God. Knowing that we fulfill the purpose. We'll be ejected. Woody Allen said, don't take life too seriously because until where I know, no one leaves alive. And it's not biblical, but I believe it. One day, we're going to have to go to our final destination. We're just like passengers on a train. And so why is the question? Why are we here? Because the expansive waves that our lives have, I like to think that I can have an impact in the world beyond our existence here on earth. It's the expansive wave. It can continue. Now listen. Everyone, I want to make this clear. Just a few things very, very briefly. All of a sudden, this will be an amazing revelation to you. But everybody, we're going to waste our fuel. We're going to use our fuel. No one will get to heaven with a full tank. We're all going to use our, our fuel. We're all going to use our lives, the fuel that has been given to us. And you have to think in what you're consuming it. What are you using it in? How do we use this fuel? Question, like my mom or my teacher would say. Why do you live? For what? What keeps you awake throughout the night? What, do you, what makes you jump out of bed? You say, Pastor, it's been years since I haven't jumped out of bed. I drag myself out. I'm like a worm going to the bathroom, dragging myself. But what made you lose your passion? Jesus said, whoever wants to save his life, Mark 8.35, will lose it. But he who loses his life by my cause and by the gospel will save it. So if you really say that you want your life to be worth it, there's only one way of doing it. You're going to have to lose it. 
You're going to have to invest all of your fuel using it, using your fuel to the service who gave his life for you. So if you put all of your fuel to the service who gave his life for you, then that's when you're willing to lose your life for he who gave it to me, he who gave it to me for free. Those that say, I'm 40 years old, 50 years old, and I never thought what I'm doing so that my life would be worth it. And this could be a reason. There's a story that says that Cyrus, the king of Persia, he's asking a rebellious uh, chief named Cabular, who was captured, he asked, he was about to execute him, and he said, if I, Cabular, Forgive your life. I give you back your life. I won't execute you. What would you do in exchange? Cabular, he responds, something that even until today, it's used in military codes. He says, Your Majesty, if you give me back my life, the minimum that I could do is serve you to the end of my days. If the Lord goes to the cross, and with his blood, he gives you back your life. You were condemned to go to hell. Your life was predestined for 80 years like this and then go to a pit. Your body will be eaten by worms and then you go to hell. That was your life. All of a sudden, the Lord says, I am giving you back your life. What would you give me in exchange? You can't pay for it because my blood is in invaluable. But what would you do in exchange? I believe, like Cabula, we could answer, Lord, minimum, minimum. In my mortal life, I would serve you to the end of my days. It's the minimum thing I could do. How many say, Lord, I believe that you have given me life and celebrate to that. Say amen. Hallelujah. It's the minimum. Now, you say, well, here's where it gets interesting. Pay attention. Are you going to? This is when it gets interesting. You say, well, Dante, the same thing always happens to me. In a service like this, I say, yes, and then I get the Monday routine. I go home, I look at my wife, or I look at the fat man I have as my husband, or I look at my mother-in-law, and that's when the world just comes to pieces. And that, like, tabular, wow, for Sparta, all of a sudden... I find myself with a pile of dirty clothes to wash. The mammoth of my son says, wash my underwear. And then your soul just drains out. The poetry is gone. The spirituality is gone. You say, I need something to impulse me beyond a message that's motivational. What impulses us? I'll give you a secret. One day, David, the King David, He's walking, I presume. The Bible doesn't say where, but by what's going to happen, I can fill the empty spaces. Imagine where he's walking while he's going to say the next phrase. He's walking in between the tents of his soldiers, and while he goes to a place, I don't know, to his own tent, his own space, he says, Ah, oh, how I wish I could drink from that fresh water that's in the entrance of Bethlehem. And he goes inside his tent, 2 Samuel 23, 15. And there, once King David breathes, there's a group of soldiers. They're crazy. No one called him. They had no obligation to do this. They take their weapons. They speak among each other. They don't receive a commandment from any official. The king doesn't put their life at risk or their head, sending them to go get some water, but themselves. They decide by their own will to go inside the enemy campsite to bring water for the king. Why do they do this? It just touches the king's heart when they do this and they bring the water. They didn't do it for the king or for, the, for Judah or for the battle. They risked their lives so that the king could drink fresh water. Why? Well, because these soldiers loved their king. And what motivated them to mark a difference was love. Amor. Motivated by love. Only and exclusively by love, they placed themselves inside the enemy's camp and they brought fresh water. Do you follow? Yes or no? Now listen. One excuse that we have, us mortals and Christians specifically, is I don't know why, but I don't have this burden for the souls. It doesn't come out of my heart to go to the hospital and, and, and pray for the sick. It doesn't come. 
This love doesn't appear. Many preachers say, God has to give you burden for the souls. And for years we're like, Lord, Lord, give me love for the souls. We look at him, oh, give me more love for the souls. Because, you know, you don't have this love for them. I mean, you, you have to love your mother-in-law. I look at her, Lord, I can't, Lord. It's something supernatural. From there, sometimes we feel bad when it's hard to get along with everyone. We say, could it be that I'm just so complex and complicated to not say another word? Am I so? Why, why, why can't I get along with everyone? I remember when I was... N not too long ago, I remember that <laughs> one of the things that was said at church was, Brother, God will not come after his church until we all love each other. And now, let's sing the song. Together, together, we would hold the hands of the snake and the serpent next to us. I mean, the person united. Because small people big hell. We knew everything from everyone. Now, hold the hands of the person to your right. Uh, united, the sister. She had the fastest tongue in Buenos Aires. And she was singing together with her serpent tongue. So you would go home struggled. Saying, Lord, I don't have love. I don't have love. And there are people here that say, well... The love for the people doesn't come. But notice that the soldiers that went to go get water, they didn't do it for the love of other soldiers. If other soldiers were there, they would say, Oh, I'm so thirsty. I feel like drinking 7-Up from the well in Bethlehem. No one would have gone. It was the king. It was the king who had the longing, and they loved their king. Follow me. Peter, he betrays Jesus. He denies him. He says he doesn't know him. He feels that he's a fraud. He goes back to fishing, to the place where he swore he would never go again. Jesus goes after him. He finds him. He prepares breakfast at the shore. And with their face to face, the betrayer and the betrayed, Jesus, after preparing breakfast for him, he points out at a fish and he says, I'm reading from John 21, 25. He says, Simon, son of John, do you love me? More than these? Yes, Lord, you know that I love you, Peter replied. Jesus said, then, take care of my sheep. Notice that Jesus never said, Peter, Simon, do you love my sheep? <laughs> he said, do you love me? Yes. Well, then, take care of my flock. You find the water for the love of the king, not necessarily for the love of your neighbor. And for loving the king so much, you start to love your neighbor. That's why it comes. The thing is that Jesus never said, do you love my, my lambs? Because if he said that, then what lamb are we talking about? He would say. Because they're lambs. We have rams. Look, you didn't have a good selection to your disciples. So who are we talking about? Judas, maybe? Forgive me. I don't want to put salt in the womb. I may be the betrayer, but at least I didn't hang myself. He didn't say, do you love my flock? The question was, do you love me? That's the question. That's the key question. It should be enough for us to offer our lives, our fuel, our proposers to the service of the king. Why are we willing to live our lives to the service of the king and then he would eject us? And there has to be an expansive wave that would remain beyond ourselves. Why are we willing? Because we love the king. And only with the king to smile, it's a commandment for us. How many believe it? Say amen. Amen. The Lord says to Peter, do you love me? Well, then take care of my flock. The question is, do you love the Lord? How many love the Lord for real? So you should serve. Because immediately then, Peter does the job. If you love me, then do it for love. Who would give me water to drink from the well of my enemies, David said. The Lord says, who will go for us? 
Who will preach to them? Who will speak to them? You say, I love you, Lord, a lot. Well, then, would you go for me? Do you really love me that much to speak to my creation that I exist? Notice that the gospel is not burden for souls, but love for the Lord. And when you love the Lord, everything you do, everything you sacrifice, you invest money, time, health. But the question is, is it worth it? Of course it is. A soldier from the United States in Vietnam War, he was about to step on an explosive mine that was hidden under the ground. And his partner that was right there next to him in the battlefield could see the position. You know, the disaster that this was going to cause. So once he saw the imminent danger, he shouted out and he said, be careful. But by shouting, a bullet all of a sudden trespassed his chest and died immediately. Years after, in a memorial service of the fallen soldiers, the veterans of the United States, this partner who was saved from stepping on that mine could know the wife and the son of this man who gave his life for him. So he came close to his little child, seven years of age. He never really knew his father. And he said, I knew your dad. He saw the kid destroyed. He says, you know what? I knew your dad. And he gave his life for me. He saved my life. And those that were there, the child looked at him. They say that the child said, and are you worth it, sir? That which you live for. Is it worth it for Christ to die for you? Is it worth it? Because every preacher says, and Christ died for you. We all know that, but are you worth it? Yes, I am worthy. No, 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 no. I ask myself if you're worthy of it. Are you honoring life? If you're worth it. If you're worth the sacrifice, because we're not saved just to decorate shelves in heaven so that God would collect us, we're saved by a purpose. And the fulfillment of that purpose is the only reaction that's acceptable that we could have to this gift that the Lord gave us, which is giving us eternal life. You have an obligation. We have a debt, a responsibility. We have a burden for he who gave his life for us. And maybe... If you accept the challenge of offering your life like a proposer so the kingdom of God would march forward in Acts 9, 6, Paul is asking the question, listen, if this question is a summary of everything I just preached to you, Saul is asking to Jesus, Lord, what do you want me to do? Notice that he doesn't have that complicated way of, of, of asking, am I, how am I going to use my gifts? He's not asking the Lord, what do I have to do with my life? Does it have to do with your will? No, it's what do you want me to do? Tell me, what do you want me to do? Like this general who was captured by King Cyrus, I will serve you. It doesn't matter doing what. You forgive my life, send me to the kitchen. Then I'll peel the potatoes. Forgive my life. Then just, I'll just broom the whole palace. If you forgive my life, then I was here this morning knowing I was going to die. I said farewell to my children, my wife. I said, these are the things of war. My head is going to roll before the court and the king. And you're telling me, Cyrus, are you going to forgive my life? <laughs> Please. I'll do anything. I'll work in the fields, even though I can never see my family again. To know that I can write to them every now and then and save my life, everything else is extra when you know you're going to die. Does this make sense? Everything's extra when you know you're going to die. From there, that's... When those who are going through cancer, when those who have been hospitalized and in bed, they start to reflect and think about everything I had, I took for granted, I never valued it. That's when I noticed, from getting up in the morning and to be able to enjoy the smile of my children at home instead of being in a white room in a hospital filled with tubes is now a blessing. That's why God has to take us to the wilderness every now and then because we get used to the oasis. That's how clumsy and foolish we are. We get used to it. We take for granted everything. Every now and then God allows a persecution to the church because we take for granted things. Every now and then we hear the news that those who are going to go to church, they have to do it through the jungle, put, taking their lives to risk. Every now and then, they kill some Christians so that we could realize that the freedom that we have is also a gift. Everything. Besides, saving our lives, everything, everything is a gift. 
everything we have, our health, to eat breakfast today, to drink some coffee today, to have someone who's, who's just there to embrace us. Everything, ladies and gentlemen, is a gift. Should we not say to the Lord as a prayer, what do you want me to do? But we don't. You know what we do in our prayers? Lord, I ask you to help me pay for my mortgage, Father. Not too much, but that dream card. Give me that card, Lord. Oh, Lord, my son has to finish his studies, Lord. Oh, I need to buy this suit. We have so many requests. So many, so many requests. There's no time to say what do you want me to do? There's no time for that. Because we never knew that we were condemned to die. We gave our life for granted. And when you take your life for granted, you start to ask for foolish things. Jesus knew it and said, hey, seek the kingdom of God. Everything else, I promise you, it will be added on to you. But seek first the kingdom of God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. To discover God's will has nothing to do with what you want to do, but what He wants to do with your life. You say, I don't know, I don't know. I have to dedicate myself to do something? No, there's something that's inside your inner cable. If you have preparation or not, want me to prove it? I'll prove it. Your body is an amazing engineering, scientists say. A design that's so complex. Did you know that your body uses more than 200 muscles? 200 muscles only to take one step. 200, 400, 600, 800. I just did exercise. Your skin in every square centimeter has 3,000 sensory cells, 12 heat sensors, 200 pain sensors, 700 sweat glands, 1 meter of blood vessels, 3 million cells, Four meters of nerve that sends messages to the brain at the speed of 300 kilometers per hour. Your brain weighs 1.5 kilograms, but it has 12 million cells. Everyone connected to 10,000 cells, which implies 120 billions, not million, billions. You heard me right. I'm not kidding, and not millions, billions. Now, what other evidence do we need to understand that we were created in a unique way, with intelligence and with a purpose? You're not an accident. You're not a mistake by your parents. You're not the product of rape. You were created in an intentional way. And to live without a purpose is not only something insolent, it's an insult to he who gave his life for you. So if you go to churches and they say something like, you have to do nothing. Salvation is not earned by works. So just rest and wait for the second coming of Christ. Run for your life. Because we believe in the coming of Christ and we know that salvation is not earned with works. But not to live with a purpose is incorrect. Laziness was never a merit, ever. The Lord criticized the lazy. He said that the roots of laziness and poverty will surround the house, says in Proverbs. You have to put an effort. You have to march forward. Work hard. You have to make life be worth it because that's the way you were birthed from the womb of your mother. Before forming you in your mother's womb, God said to Jeremiah, I chose you. Before you were born, I set you apart. Do you know what he's saying to Jeremiah? I chose you to be a prophet for the nations before your father wanted to have love with your mom. It wasn't starting from, well, and then a little sperm ran the race. No, before that. Before that. Before you were formed. Before that night of passion and revival and lust. I chose you. Psalms 139 says, My bones are not unknown to you when they were formed. When in the deepest part of the earth I was made, your eyes saw my body, everything. It's in the scriptures. I don't know about you, but I just can't get used to it. 
listening that God was calling the prophet before he was born, that God had chosen John before he was born, that he was going to call Samson to deliver before he was born, because I know very well the plans I have for you, says the Lord, plans of good, not to harm you, to give you hope and a future. God has a plan for your life. The answer is yes. But there's something better. God says, I have a good plan for your life. A good one. A good one. You can't imagine it. It's extraordinary. Hallelujah. You are holy. No, 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 no. You can't take the luxury of living without a purpose. We don't know when we're going to leave. We all remember the day we arrive. I remember I came here on the 6th of June. I mean for the present so that you could prepare them. But we don't know when we're going to leave. We don't know. It could be today. It could be tomorrow. You say, oh no, I'm too young for that. My brother was 46 years old, my age. He went to have an analysis as a routine, and he had a massive heart attack, and he left him at my age in a bed forever. He passed away. Maybe God will allow you to live like my parents. I don't know. But life is not about how you resist here. But if it's worth the sacrifice that Jesus did for you, and many of those that died really never lived, but tell me that you'll live. That's the calling that God gives us today. And I'll end this series of messages that speak about what? Discovering God's will. Not necessarily will make you to do it. God says, did you discover my will today? Did I reveal it to you? Then who will go for me? That's Jesus' longing. Will you go without a general sending you? Without a pastor telling you? You will. Then you will touch the king's heart. Because love is what will motivate you. Do you love me? Do you love me? Tell me that you love me, because if you do love me, you'll do it. If you love me, then you'll do it for love. It's a principle. Love the king, serve the army. Love the Lord, then take care of his flock, because you love him. Do you love me, says the Lord? How many love the Lord today? Please stand up, because this is a calling to serve.